cook that. Man, clean and lang with that. I get mad sometimes when I get to the back. So, uh, I've got some of the down here. Okay, now I'm going to have her just come out to the back. How much do you say these are? Let them gain. What? Let them gain. Let them go? Yes. Can you ever see Blazing Saddles? Let them gain. Wave them off, wave them off. Cut away. I was looking to see what se section to look in. Okay. Federation of Labor? Dixie Federation of Labor. Dixie. Okay. That's it. That's it. Okay. Looking for 15. Want to read it out loud? Mm -hmm. No, I just. Look, I'm just looking at that name. Have you seen it? Oh yeah, I've seen it before. There, there's the names. There's names on there. I told you there are names. There's one that's incorporated. Oh. Okay. That's what I'm trying to tell them. You want to read them out loud? No, you go ahead. No, I, can't. I don't I can't. know these people. Well, just read them like they are. I'm not teaching them. Okay, hold on. Just how about I read them out and you tell me if where I they are or about something about them? Okay. Here, start to. There's the date. July 27, 1932. 1932. Thirty-three. July twenty-seven, nineteen thirty-three. Yes. Office of Probate Judge. Nice. Application for charter by the Dixie Federation of Labor. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then it has we the undersigned for yeah. the purpose of forming a corporation pursuant to the provisions of the current civil code of the state of Alabama. Yeah. 
do hereby associate ourselves as a body corporate and do hereby adopt the following certificate of incorporation. And then back here. These are the one you named over. Right. It was in the old diction now. This is the old diction here. Right. The one that was formed even it, before. It before the FL command. This is a, this is the Dixie Federation labor. All these names. C.W. Posey. I remember him. Yeah. He's dead. J.W. Higginbotham. He's dead. Marvin State. He's dead. Ollie Hamilton. He's dead. Paul Moon. He's dead. J.C. Turner. He's dead. He's dead. George Green. He's dead. W.A. Howell. He's dead. W.O. Howell. He's dead. They related? Hey, I've got to hold it just a moment. Rolling. You want to open? Put your fingers there. Now this okay. is a charter that we charted, yeah, wrote out, incorporated in the law of the land, what we wanted. What's it say up here? Application for the charter by the Dixie Federation of Labor. And what's the date? July the 27th, 1933. <laughs> so this is it? And that's it. Nothing about it. We, the undersigned, for the purpose of forming a corporation under and pursuant to the provisions of the current civil code of the state of Alabama. That's right. We file on the law. He won't appear to the lawyer. Oh, no. Our friend, he knew it. So he knew the law. And then, uh, are these the undersigned here these on the, the next under, page? These are the undersigned people. It's willing to sign their name on it to where we can make the court stand up and keep it up to so those are a bunch of brave people there. I'm just trying to find mine. I know it's on there somewhere. Burns Cup. There I am up there. Where do you where did you live back then? I lived at uh How's it here? Indale. Yeah. Indale. One hand in there. Yeah. Are there any names, sir? You want to tell me about some of these other folks? Well, as I said, most of them are all, all dead now. But as we set up this organization, we wanted to be known as the Dixie Federation of Labor. And we formed it. We took our money and we paid for the charter. Everything. Done all the detail work on it. Where'd you get the money for the charter? We paid, bombed, even, I hate to say it, one of our members sold his wife watch pot to help get money to incorporate this tree. That's how bad off we was at that time. It's a great story. A.C. Bain, Gladden, Alan Bain, Burns, McClendon, North Cheryl, J.D. Lewis, Junior Verwarren, B.A. Sanders, Marcine McClendon, Roy Lewis, Jane Jones, Hopper, Fortin, Fortin, and Rufus Freeman, Joe Miller, Andy Duke, George Hickenbottom, B.D. Depper, Fortin Phillips, Fortin Phillips, he dead. Harvey Bush, he dead. George Nelson, I remember all of them. I remember all these names that come back to me since I've seen the book. But this is what the original Dixie Federation of Labor was incorporated on the state law of Alabama in 1933. I think I'm done. Want to read some more names? If you're going down, who's dead and who's alive? C.W. Poe is dead. J.V. Hickenbottom is dead. Marvin Stadium is dead. Oliver Hamilton is dead. Paul Moon is dead. J.C. Turner. George Green. A.W. Howell. W.O. Howell. T.W. Jones, Gail Connor, Herbert Garrett, Hugh Garrett, you talked to him. Hugh he, Garrett. He's alive. Yeah. Bohannon's dead. Rod Saul's dead. Homer Saul's dead. John Roberts, Doe Wayne Mays, Willie Cooper, C.G. Gilbert Willett, Emil Lockener, J.M. Merrick. That's a man. Tell me that story again, what happened? Is W.A. Lawson? W.A. Lawson's man told his wife, what's the 
him get the money to pay for the church. That's an incredible story. It is. It's been a lean over here. Nothing we can do about it, but uh, we don't have that. He named Jordan. He can vote on it. How much Gordon did it cost to, to incorporate it? I didn't know what to buy. It wasn't much. But even then, it was uh, hard to get all the money together. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Looking at more history. Okay. Kind of my, my name happened to be on that thing. He wanted to be carried on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He comes up here telling me his daddy had been over here. All right. Uh, the people in today's, uh, the children in schools today should know about uh, the Dixie Federation of Labor. You were going to go tell them about their own history. Oh, I thought yeah, I was going to ask them to speak one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Rubber, steel, automobile workers, down crane, everything was organized. Yeah. Stores, clerks, everything. Yeah. We had we had this town solid unity. Yeah. Yeah. One time. Yeah. Do you think that, that today's children really know that story? No. You've been here. You you got out in the light today, but lots of people never never even know. Okay. Says you got tapes and history in there, didn't you? <laughs> Judy. Judy goes into the elevator to find the ghost. How's it going? Speed. Action. Yeah, I think they're right down here. Let's see the Gadsden time, September and October. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take these. Can you carry them? Right, I've got them. All right. Great. Take them down. Use them. Action. James, or I should call you Jim. Jim. You and I have Sorry, been... Sorry, Jim, just Jim. Okay. Yeah. Just that. Uh, you can call me Janet. Okay. Jim, you and I have both been doing some research on uh, this strike. I've been looking at the entire South. Uh, you've been going into depth into one specific community. Uh, we've both used a lot of different sources. Uh, maybe we could compare notes about the kinds of sources we used. Uh, okay. I know we've got these newspapers out here. Um, Want to tell me about them? 
Well, these are the uh, 1934 uh, Gadsden uh, newspapers that provide uh, a wealth of information on the strike. They provide a good uh, primary source for the strike itself and for uh, social history of Gadsden in 1934. Uh, have you found any additional sources that would benefit to you and your, your research? Well, I never got to look at, at these newspapers. In fact, I didn't do the kind of in-depth research on Gadsden and the Dwight Mills um, at all that you managed to, to do in, in your work. Uh, but newspapers exist for, of course, all communities, and I completely agree with you about their value. Uh, they, they give you a real local picture of what's going on and make you realize that things are different in different areas. Oh, yeah. Is one of the oh, things yeah. That oh, yeah. You agree with that? Oh, yeah. And um, the other thing, of course, was using uh, interviews with people who might remember the 34 strike. Of yes. course, it's been yes. over 50 years. Yes. Was, yes. Uh, well, I was able to interview uh, uh, several different people uh, for the local strike in Gadsden. Uh, one difficulty I <clears throat> encountered was the strike being more than 50 years old, a lot of people have uh, are deceased and a lot of people are no longer available uh, to share their uh, their knowledge of the strike uh, uh, and it's getting more and more difficult uh, to try to contact people just because so many of them are deceased. Uh, I found that uh, several people I contacted and tried to interview uh, uh, for their their role in the strike did not want to talk about it. Uh, s several people I uh, uh, called or contacted uh, still have hard feelings or strong feelings about the 1934 cotton mill strike here in Gadsden and did not want to discuss the strike when I tried to arrange an interview with them to talk to them about the strike. Uh, they basically hung up the telephone and just refused to uh, talk to me about it or discuss it. They did not want to uh, say anything about their involvement in the strike or their role in the strike, what they did in the strike. So this was a problem too. Uh, Let's start again. Jim, you had a lot more. Ignore that camera. <laughs> Please. Please. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that getting testimony from witnesses, people who were there, can be such a valuable source of information, especially when you don't have anything written down and when it's a strike that has been uh, not very well researched, not very well remembered, uh, to find people who are alive and can tell you about it. And then to discover that they won't talk to you once you've discovered this person who might be a valuable resource must have been an enormous source of frustration to you. Yeah, yeah, it was, of course. Obtaining people's uh, oral testimony, oral history uh, relating uh, uh, what they experienced uh, during the uh, 1934 strike is really the best source of information or certainly one of the best sources of information uh, you can get. Uh, I did contact several people who uh, uh, did not want to discuss the strike. They did not want to talk about their involvement in the strike. Uh, when I called and asked to try to arrange an interview to talk to them about it, uh, they seemed shocked that uh, I had their name and number. They wanted to know how I knew uh, where they were, how to call them. And when I told them I wanted to try to discuss a strike with them, then the phone would go down on the hook, and they absolutely refused to talk to me about it. So a lot of these people I found still have strong feelings about the strike. Uh, they uh, uh, don't want to discuss their role in the strike, and uh, apparently uh, uh, just... Uh, still have a hangover of 1934 that they don't want to talk about. But I don't understand what they don't want to talk about. You know what I'm saying? I mean... Well, uh, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing for me to try to uh, evaluate or uh, determine a reason for. Uh, what I think one, one factor is that regardless of what side they were on, if they were management or union, uh, they just basically have strong feelings about the strike from their perspective. They, if uh, union people or people, uh, employees at the mill, uh, thought that the company was not fair with them, they still have strong feelings about that. They think the company cheated them. Uh, 
they have strong feelings about that. Management people were opposed to unions on principle. They objected to their local workforce uh, trying to organize a union as a matter of principle. They have strong feelings on that. And I think what you, what you have <clears throat> is people with uh, strong points of view uh, that have not subsided, uh, that remain apparently as, uh, uh, I guess, strong today as they were as they were in 34. So, uh, now John, cut right in and say, well, I had the same experience. <laughs> okay. I had the same experience. I had uh, somebody who simply wouldn't tell me why, but he just didn't want to talk. Someone who asked me, uh, when I told him I was from Duke University, he asked me if I was a communist, said he didn't want to talk to me. I'm sorry, we're going to have to stop a minute. How did you find the names of the people? Wait a minute, we've got to stop too. Okay, go. How did you find the names of the people that you tried to, to look up who might have remembered or witnessed the strike? Well, I started uh, by getting names uh, from the newspaper and uh, names that I saw in any, any reference source, uh, uh, the newspaper, uh, the library here has several local history books or texts that has names of people who were affiliated with the strike in 34. Uh, names that uh, I obtained from reference sources, I contacted those people first and uh, tried to get an additional uh, names from them, asked them uh, who they worked with, uh, who else was in the uh, union in 1934, and tried to expand my base from there, but get a list of names and contact those people. If they talk to me, I always ask them if they knew anybody right. else, their friends who sure. may have worked at the mill, uh, who else they knew right. uh, who was right. in the union in 1934, uh, these kinds of things. but. Uh, some people were uh, were v very helpful and cooperative, but it was difficult to try to try to talk with people. Now I had some bad experiences. <clears throat> I mean, I had people who simply refused to talk to me, and that's a shock, uh, yeah, especially yeah. when you're so excited about finding somebody who might be able to give you an eyewitness account of yeah. what was happening. Yeah. And uh, you had some of those experiences too. Uh, yes, uh, the two problems I had. <clears throat> Uh, were uh, uh, being referred to names of people uh, who were deceased, people uh, who have died since 1934. The strike was more than 50 years, uh, uh, 50 years uh, old, uh, and so many people are now deceased. Uh, they're not available to uh, 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 talk to about the strike, and several people that I did try to contact about the strike and line up an interview refused to talk to me. They uh, did not want to discuss their role in the strike. They did not want to uh, talk about the strike. And when I asked them to, uh, if they would uh, talk to me about it, try to line up an interview uh, to dis uh, discuss the strike uh, to them, they just hung up the telephone uh, and refused to talk to me about it, refused to discuss it. Um, they uh, seemingly still have strong feelings uh, on the strike and do not want to discuss their role in the strike, their involvement in the strike, and uh, wouldn't talk wouldn't talk to me about it. So I guess the main problems, I, difficulties I encountered trying to uh, talk to people were just that so many people are now deceased; they're no longer here. Okay, we are repeating ourselves okay. over and over and over. Again. Because I'm not cutting in. No, partly. you're not cutting in. No, it's not. Uh, Roland, uh, this, this turn stuff with some librarian. Okay, Jim, I've read your thesis about the Gadsden strike here in 34, uh, and I noticed there were only about four or five uh, people who are veterans of the strike listed in your sources. Why? Yeah, my experience <coughs> in researching the paper was that uh, very many of the people that I wanted to talk to and tried to contact for the strike are now deceased. They have died since the strike. Another factor is that very many people that uh, I did uh, uh, contact about the strike uh, uh, did not want to discuss it. Uh, when I contacted several uh, to try to arrange an interview uh, for the strike, 
Uh, they just uh, let me know that they did not want to discuss their affili affiliation with the strike or talk about their role in the strike. Did they explain uh, why? Uh, no, I got very few ex explanations. Uh, several people I called seemed surprised or shocked that I had their name uh, and telephone number and they did, did ask how I got their name. And then when I tried to answer that question and arrange an interview, uh, they just let me know in no uncertain terms that they would not discuss it with me and they hung up the telephone in my ear and I didn't get any further with them. So uh, several people that <coughs> I did make contact with uh, just refused to talk about the strike. Do you have any idea why? My opinion of that is probably that they still have strong feelings about what happened in 1934, uh, regardless of what side they were on, if they were management or union. Uh, they still have strong feelings about what management did or about what the union did. Uh, and uh, basically those issues of 1934 are still real to these people and they didn't want to discuss it. Still real in Gadsden of the 1990s? Well, real to these people, to the people I contacted and tried to uh, interview who did not want to talk about uh, uh, who did not want to talk about the 34 strike, uh, but today unions are not an issue in Gadsden. Uh, uh, Gadsden is today a union town, so we're talking about 1934, almost 60 years ago. Uh, the conditions of 1934 do not apply to today. Okay, uh, John? Why did you do this topic? Well, I felt like, I felt like, uh, the cotton mill industry uh, is a facet of southern history and American history that is no longer here and it's fast fading from the scene. Uh, in a few more years, the people who are surviving now will not be available to talk to or discuss a strike with. So, uh, uh, so many areas of research uh, are now denied to us and will be even more difficult in the future. So, uh, But a strike. I mean, you could have done the lives of the cotton mill villagers, you could have done their social life, you could have done, but a strike. Well, this strike was interesting. The <clears throat> 1934 cotton textile strike was interesting, uh, both in Alabama and nationally, because it came at a time of transition between the AFL and the CIO. Now, the CIO was not organized until 1935 or 1936. I forget the exact year, but it came after the 34 cotton textile strike. So basically what you had was the AFL, a trades union, skilled crafts union, uh, trying to represent industrial workers. Uh, and <clears throat> basically the AFL effort failed in 34. One factor is that from the union's pers perspective, the AFL just was not qualified to try to lead that kind of strike. Uh, the CIO is a Congress of Industrial Organization for Industrial Workers, factory plant members. Uh, this ties in together, this ties in together because at least in Alabama, before 1934 there was not a major uh, effort to organize southern cotton mills, Alabama cotton mills, cotton textile mills. Uh, but conditions that existed in the early uh, 